So welcome to this talk on more than you want to know about BP at Fairfair. I'm Shang Si Yu, and I'm in the hardware enablement Taipei team uh, under Joy. And I mainly work on BPF in this uh, SLES and the OpenSUSE kernel. So why this talk? Well, this talk talks about how BPF Verifier works under a hood. So it mainly focuses on the concept rather than the code. And the reason I want to talk about this is because, well, it's, it's pretty cool. So I want everybody to know about it. And hopefully this talk will make people more comfortable with BPF. Although it's entirely possible that after a talk, you felt more scared than before. That's, that's also likely. And also I want to get more people working on BPF. More eyeballs, less bug, and it's better overall for me. So let's begin. A bit of background and on BPF. So BPF is an internal virtual machine, and it runs user-provided code, which usually sounds like a bad idea. But the good thing is that we can run BPF code in a relatively quite safe manner. And because of this, we can have a lot of use case with BPF. You run custom code on tracing and profiling, networking, and security. Those are pretty good use case that you might need customization and BPF helps. And so in kernel virtual machine, what does it look like? So we have a virtual CPU and some memory. The virtual CPU has register, which are used for calculation. And you also have a memory that's a stack that's 512 bytes for storing the variables. And I would say we have 10 plus one register in the virtual CPU. 10 plus one because R0 to R9 are both readable and writable. And the 11th register, R10, is a frame pointer. So it points to the top of the set, which allows the BPF program to utilize the stack. And it runs user-provided code. What do they look like? Well, user usually write BPF program with C, but other language is possible. And say you write it in C, you pass it to the compiler. The compiler will produce BPF instruction. Uh, in the user space, it's also known as BPF bytecodes. Anyway, so the plus or the addition you have is translated into a BPF instruction that does the addition. And on the left, it's a conceptual representation of the BPF app, uh, add instruction, which is what the assembler will use. But within the BPF, well, within the Linux kernel code, it's more common to see something on the right, which is using a macro to produce the instruction. The instruction itself is a struct of BPF instruction, and it has some field. The most important one is the opcode field, which basically say what kind of instruction this is. It's either for our previous example, the BPF add instruction actually looks like this. So it's saving the result to destination at uh, register R0 using both R0 and R1 as the source. And the offset and immediate is unused in this case, which I will just, uh, I will omit in this case. But a small detail is that the opcode is actually divided into finer subcategories. The main part to look for is a class, which, which is basically how the BPF instruction are grouped. And with that background, we can talk a bit more about safety. So what does safety mean when we say the user code can be run safely? Well, safety in the Linux kernel con uh, context is roughly this. So these four things. First, it should not have invalid memory use, either read or write. And it shouldn't have any address leakage, which can cause security issues down the line. Also, the program should terminate, and it should not violate any spec. But this is spec is more of a BPF thing. And these are all guaranteed by the BPF verifier. What the BPF verifier does is that it will run static analysis on user-provided code. And what it actually tries to do is try to prove that the code, 
the program is safe. If it's safe, then it can run. If not, it, it will reject. And the scope of the analysis of the verifier is quite limited. So it verifies the BPF program individually, program by program. And it will exclude the BPF function call or a helper that calls to something that's within the kernel. Those within the kernel part are out of scope and not verified. And this static analysis is actually done by a ton of function in the BPF verifier code. That's like around a bit more than I think one, one million line. Anyway, a, a lot of things. And so let's talk a bit more static analysis, which is the, the main thing that BPF verifier does. Well, static analysis in, for the BPF verifier, it does the follow. It will track the state of the BPF virtual machine as each instruction is executed. So after, so when each, st uh, in after, after emulation of the instruction, the BPF verifier will conclude what kind of state the verifier is currently in. And with that state, it will look at the next instruction and see if the next instruction can, can be run with the current state. And to see the, how the state are tracked, let's see the structure that's used for tracking this virtual machine. For each program, the BPF verifier has a BPF func state. And within it, the main part is that it has an array of BPF register state. That's where the fun part is. And the BPF register state uh, consists of what, what's being tracked for each register. For now, we're most interested in the type. Let's discuss that first, which brings us to type tracking. Type tracking, as the name implies, it tracks what kind of value is stored in the register. And the, the, this information is actually inferred by the BPF verifier from the instructions. So user cannot really interfere or try to cheat. And there are three possible type well, three main type that's used by BPF verifier. The first is not init, which as the name implies, it means that the register is not initialized. The second is scalar, which is basically just plain number. So anything that's not a pointer it is a scalar. And the third, as I have mentioned, is a pointer. The pointer type are actually quite fine grained. You'll see that there's a lot of pointer type which helps the BPF verify tracks various things. The most interesting thing, interesting type is the pointer to context, which is a BPF context. And that, that's actually very overloaded. It can differ from program to program, depending on what type of BPF program you're dealing with. For BPF socket filter type, it's a pointer to context is actually just a pointer to escape of. And for XDP program, it's a pointer to XDP MD. K probe, it's a PT reg. And when the verifier starts the analysis, it will initialize the state of each register as follow. And you'll see that R1 is a pointer to context, because as I mentioned, context is the argument given to the BPF program. And since the BPF calling convention main date that the first argument is passed through R1, uh, R1 is pointer to context. And for the other argument, if, if, there is, if, if there is more, it's passed through R2, R3, R4, and R5. And the return value is, goes through R0. And that's the initial state. Now let's just have a taste of it, see what example program goes through the verifier. So one of the safety guarantee that I've previously mentioned is that it should not leak any kernel address. And so here we have a program that tries to leak the kernel address. You can see that we can kind of like cheat the compiler by casting, but as we'll see, this won't work uh, trying to cheat the verifier. 
So that program actually just compiled to two BPF instruction. First is a BPF move instruction, and the second is the exit. And let's take a look at the first instruction first. So when we when when the BPF verify starts, the state look like this. And after running the after emulating the BPF move instruction, we move what's inside R1 register into R0. So the BPF verifier infers that, well, so whatever type R1 is, R0 will get the same type. So R0 is now also pointer to context. And this is fine. The verifier allows it, and we can continue. And the fun actually happened in the second instruction, which is the exit. So at the exit, BPF verifier will check that the return value is a scalar. And in this case, it's not a scalar. So BPF verifier will reject this code. And that is how type checking helps the BPF verifier to reject unsafe program. And if you actually load it, it will, BPF verifier will complain this. R0 leaks address as return value. Now, there's actually more types than the than those I've shown before. And these additional types are what called composite types. So composite types are a composed of two things, the base type and something new called BPF type flag. And these are kind of like a modifier of the base type. For our example, we'll take a look at the pointer, maybe new type, yeah, type the flag. So when we have when we see the previous BPF register type, I actually hide something. Below, below we have the base type and a modified type. The base type is a pointer to map value, and the modified type is pointer to map value or no. And the reason that we need this is because some helper function called called by BPF program may fail. And when they fail, they return null. So to ensure that the user check those value, we have composite type. And when the user checks the value, it, and the value is not null, the type actually changes into pointer to map value. And in this case, user can start using it for things useful or the referencing. However, if the return value is null, the type will actually change into scalar value. And in this case, the user cannot dereference it. And that's how uh, the composite type works. So just side tracking a bit, I also want to talk about tracking the value in stacks. So as you remember, stack is where the BPF program stores the variable. And the reason that uh, stack is used because register is a limited resource. And sometimes when the register are all used, we may still need to do other calculation. And in that case, to make room for the calculation, we need to save the register value onto stack, also known as building the stack. And afterward, the stack value need to be loaded back from, oh, the stack value will be loaded back into the register. And in this case, the register state should also be preserved when it's loaded, so or when it's filled from stack. So to do this, the BPF found state has an array called uh, BPF state, stack state, which tracks all the stack, all the space in the stack for what kind of value and type they may be, which is stored, uh, which is tracked by the embedded BPF reg state that we have seen before. And with that out of the way, we can start talking about, I think, the most important concept of BPF verifier. And that concept is value tracking. So value tracking is mainly used for tracking to prevent invalid memory use, either read or write. And to see a better example, say we have an array of four bytes, ARR, 
And in this case, we're trying to do an index access using the index i. An important question is whether i is less than 4. If it's not less than 4, then we have an out-of-bound access. And to do this, we need to use value tracking. That's where it comes in. And value tracking is actually quite hard because there is 2 to the 64 uh, possible values. And besides that, value can be combined by addition or other operations. So let's start with an if approach for value tracking. Let's just put all the possible value in the set. So if we want to say that x can only be 1, we have a set that has one element that's 1. And if we want to say 1, uh, y can be either 0, 1, or 2, we have a, a set of three elements. And for tracking addition, it's just a combination of all the possible elements, adding them, and then forming the new set, which is 1, 2, 3 in this case. And as you might have guessed, that's not really a good idea to implement because tracking each value, even if you're just using one bit, um, it takes 2 to the 31 gigabyte for a single register, if my calculation is correct. I'm not sure. But anyway, that, that turned out to be a very bad idea. And not just that. If you also try to track addition, you also need to go through all the possible combinations which should take forever and also a bad idea. So a better approach, which I think it's quite, quite easy to imagine, is to use an interval to represent a set. So in this case, instead of what we do previously, we use an interval. So x is an interval from 1 to 1 inclusive. y is an interval from 0 to 2 inclusive. And the good thing about this is that addition is just two operations. You add the min two minimum to get the lower bound and add the two upper bound to get the new upper bound, which is pretty easy. And implementation is also easy. You just track two values. And tracking addition is also quite easy. Just add them to operation, as I said. Now, there's one downside to this, though. That is, compared to the set approach, you couldn't be that precise. For example, you cannot represent a non-consecutive set, say 1 and 3. The best you can do is have an interval from 1 to 3, which ends up being 1, 2, and 3. So you have an, one more value, 2, inside there. And that, that is one of the problems. The second problem is that tracking binary operation is pretty hard. Say if you want to track x or, how do you do that? Well, it's I, I think it's maybe doable, but it's, it ends up pretty hard. A viable approach is just throw your hands up and say I know nothing. Um, set the full range, which which could work, but there's also a better way, and that brings us to the tri-state number, which is also called tnum in the kernel. So tri-state number, the way it works is that it tracks each bit in the binary number. And for each bit, it can either be set to 1, set to 0, or just unknown. And to create the tnum, let's use a similar example, x is 1, and y is either 1 or 3. And to convert them into tnum, we oh all right, and notice that one and three is not consecutive, consecutive in this case. So anyway, the way we convert them to tnum is first create a binary representation. For one, it's zero one. For one and three, it's zero one and one one. And with this, you start creating the tnum. So what you do is you look at the upper bit. So in this case, upper bit can only be 0. So I put 0 here. And the lower bit can only be 1. So x is x will be represented by the 0, 1 tnum. For y, we also look at the upper bit. And in this case, it can be both. It can either be 0 or it can be 1. So we set this to unknown 
both is possible. And now the same thing, the lower bit. This case, it's both one. So we put a one here. And that is the basic of Tina. Here, instead of using the set, we represent x as 0, 1, tnum, and y as unknown 1, tnum. And this actually, kept, in this case, tnum actually captures the non-consecutive nature of 1 and 3 precisely. So that's better than the interval approach. And you could also do addition tracking in this case. Uh, we can track x plus 1. And in this case, it will end up being a tnum of unknown, unknown, and 0. And the reason is that unknown can propagate. So in this case, the, the I guess, the most leftward bit is actually unknown because the, the addition can, has carry. And in the Linux kernel, if you take a look, tnum addition is implemented like this. It's actually quite complicated. I don't really understand it. But the good thing is that it's formally verified by a paper, some precise and fast abstract interpretation of tracing num. And I also have a layman version below if you're interested. So all, all seems good for tnum, but there is also a problem with it as well. So tnum is also like interval, it's not precise, but in a different way. It cannot represent type bound. So if you have a type bound of one to two, this is what happened. So one to two, convert them to set, and then convert them to binary, and convert them to tnum, which the first bit could be zero and one, so unknown. And the second bit could be either zero and one again, so also unknown. And now we have a tnum that's both bit is unknown. So what happens if we try to convert it back? Well, since both bit is unknown, we actually have the four possible combination of bits. So 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. This ends up being 0, 1, 2, and 3. So as we can see, tnum is also has its own problem. Trying to represent the type bound, you end up with more number. So this brings us to the question. So which method should we use for Friday tracking? And why not both? So that's the answer for the UTF kernel developer. And we end up in practice tracking both the interval and tnum at the same time. And this is, so inside the BPF register state, you'll see this. First is the far off variable offset, which is a tnum. And the second part of the value tracking is actually a lot of min and max value. I'm just showing the S64, but there's also the U64 and for the 32 byte there's as well. Now we can look at the second example program. This ex example program is actually a bit convoluted, so I'll try my best. And we're see I'm using the almost the same example again. We have an array and we have an inter unsigned integer i. But instead of doing the array access straight up, we're doing a bound check. So we're checking that i is less than 4 before proceeding to the uh, index access. And if you compile the code, it will end up like this. With, so these are the BPF instructions that represent the program. And the first thing to, that you have to trust me is that when we are loading I into the BPF virtual machine, I is actually outside of the BPF virtual machine. It's from something called BPF map, which is stored uh, globally and can be modified by either user space or other BPF program. So in this case, any value can be read. Any, any value is possible. So the way we track it is just to say that any value is possible. 
So it's in the interval of 0 to 2 to the 64 minus 1. And for the TNUM representation, all bits is unknown. And because TNUM is actually a bit too verbose, I'll be using just the interval for the going forward. And after the, after the I is loaded, we can proceed to see the most important next instruction, which is we have an if statement. So if R, R2 is greater than three, go to nine, which, and if it's not, then continue. And this is represented by a BPF jump instruction. But the main thing is that we are doing a branching here. So we either continue our execution, moving on to instruction number six, or we could jump forward to instruction nine. And the way that BPF verifier check, uh, tracks this branching is that it does a branching itself within the state, uh, within the BPF verifier state. So on the left, we have the possible route where BPF, uh, where the R2 is not greater than three. So R2 is less than three. In that case, we can check, we can tell that the, the interval of R2, the upper bound will be three. And the rest is left the same. So we just copy over, the verified, copy them all over. So in this branch, R2 is a scalar value, the same, but the interval from, from zero to two to 64 minus one becomes an interval from zero to three. And in the other branch, it's quite similar, but in this case, we know R2 is greater than three. So the minimum bound of the interval is set four and the rest of them gets also copy over. So in this branch, R2 is a scalar value from four to the maximum possible for U64. And that is actually the gist of value tracking. Um, try to track all the value as it's gone through addition or other things. And if there's branch, branch the state. And then the BPF verifier will continue on from these two state and deriving new state from it and continue checking. And in this case, we're actually more interesting on the true on, on the left side of the branch where we actually will start doing array difference. And this is the, this is, so before the referencing the array, we have to first start with pointer arithmetic. And in this case, it's just adding R2 to R3, R3.2 ARR. This is by the BPF add instruction. And the BPF, the pointer as arithmetic as check as follow. This is quite a brief version. So pointer arithmetic is also only allowed for between pointer type and scalar type. And you can only do addition, not subtraction. Although theoretically subtraction, for example, if you're using this, the stack, subtraction is just adding a negative number. And Anyway, so for pointer arithmetic, the BFF verifier checks that we are adding a pointer to a scalar, which is allowed. And also the verifier will track the size of that, that region the pointer is pointing to. In this case, the size is four. And we're adding an interval that's zero to three, which is less than four. And that's fine. So we can proceed to the next step. If we're adding something that's larger than four, uh, the BPF verifier will reject at here. And that is actually the basic, well, the, the main gist of how failure tracking and pointer arithmetic work. So it sounds, it sounds simple, but in, in actual practice, it's quite confusing because you have to deal with sinus and you have to do with deal with overflow on the flow. There's also alignment. You have 64 bit and 32 bit. And there's just so many pointer type to check. And one of the biggest issue for the BPF verifier is algorithmic, uh, the algorithmic complexity. 
as you can imagine, branching is quite complex. It uses much more, like every time you branch, you double the memory usage. So when we're trying to tracking a loop, for example, the branching can easily get out of hand. And that is, and so if you look at the BPF register, say, here are all the ranges the BPF verifier tracks. And that is actually my, my main talk. So uh, the following just some tips and tricks that I've made my slides. So I, I'll just skip them for now. The, the one I want to mention a bit is that BPF verifier also does some interesting things. So even though it's called verifier, it does instruction patching itself. It changes the program that's loaded. So this is mainly for code sanitization, for either spectral mitigation or bound limiting, which is the BPF verifier will insert some instruction that does a masking to make sure that when you're doing an maybe index access, the index is within that, is really within that bound. And also it makes deficient by zero and mod modulo by zero impossible. So in X, X, uh, 64, we don't run into exceptions. And just some note about tracing. So tracing program, tracing BPF program are kind of special. They are treated uh, differently. So all the invalid memory access doesn't apply. And this is done with helpers. And, and here's some resources if you're interested with BPF verifier. I find the security CV write-up actually quite helpful. And if you're interested in talk, here's some. And the documentation, also some interesting commit. And I'd really recommend these two papers. And also if you're interested in the academic, academic things, uh, you can look at stuff static analysis, abstract interpretation, um, symbolic execution, and such. So the interval domain here is actually the interval range or tracking. And the bit field domain is another name for genome. And that's, that's it. That's my talk. I actually finished in time, which I'm glad. So I think I can take questions now. Hello, uh, this is my, uh, I have a question, uh, yeah. perhaps related to the verifier, uh, or no, no, sorry, to the instructions. Uh, is there an equivalent of a while loop in a BPF instructions? I mean, a loop that terminates based on some condition. Yeah, there, there is, you could, uh, on the newer kernel, I forgot which exact version, but the newer kernel supports a bounded loop. So it, it, the underneath, it's still the same jump instruction, conditional jump instruction. Um, look, so it'll jump determined by the value inside a certain register, decide to jump or not. That's used to implement the while loop if, if the condition is, I guess, it, if it's if it's not met or met, anyway, it, it will jump a negative number of instruction back towards the, the beginning for the while loop. And that, that, is actually, uh, that is actually quite difficult to implement. So the BPF verifier has to do some state pruning to get it to work. And it's, I think it's limited to certain number of loop I think like like maybe one million. It cannot loop more than some some number of time. But in the newer kernel, it's supported. And the other thing is, there's also a BPF loop helper. So you, I forgot how it's used, but you can pass something in to that to that helper, and the loop looping is done within the BPF 
helper. So it's not checked by the verifier. It's kind of offloaded. And for the older kernel, loop is not supported. But usually, uh, you can use Clang's uh, pragma unroll to unroll the loop if you that that will work for some some code. Uh, thank you. still have 10 minutes so if you want to make use of the time if there are no more questions i guess you could you could present some more slides so i actually have a question this is jerry um so I know that the preempt RT patch set disables uh, BPF mostly because it basically allocates uh, or just freeing and allocating memory in atomic context. Do you see a way around it, or do you think that BPF and preempt RT will be incompatible forever? Thank you. I I actually not that sure, but I know current upstream has implemented BPF spe uh, specific allocator. So maybe that could in turn help. I'm I'm not really sure. Yeah, RT is unknown region for me. Okay, yeah, thanks. Probably so. need to ask Daniel. Thank you. Yeah, um, just on the RT. Um, so upstream has fixed that. So RT, um, BPF is working with RT at All this right. point. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So, what, 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 how, how does it actually fix it? Fix it. I, I know there were a couple more uh, reasons to to be incompatible, but I think the, the most, the biggest one was really the allocation and freeing of the memory from from atomic context, right? Yeah. So, I think the the, the major blocker were the um, the real uh, the the locking infrastructure they used. Uh, Thomas fixed it basically. So um, you get uh, some hit from the BPF programs, obviously. Um, especially um, one problem is the the, the unpreemptive part of the BPF. So if it can't be preempted, then obviously the run uh, it it interferes with the with the execution of of the RT tasks. Um, but basically. Uh, upstream is depending on BPF available. So system D and so on are not working anymore without BPF. So we have to bite the bullet and see how it works. <laughs> yeah, that was exactly the reason I was asking. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Just a note. Uh, I, uh, I see Ikos was asking about memory allocation. I think the new memory allocator uh, has some pool of pre-allocated memory that can be used in the atomic context. And then there is some kernel thread that uh, ref refills uh, the, pool, the pool asynchronously. And also another note remark that not uh, the B system D works even without BPF, but not all the features. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think one thing I'm glad presenting is that every time presenting at SUSE Labs Compass, like I, I always learn something new. So I guess I could try present a bit more, um, unless there's a question. Just if there's any, just like open cam and just ask. So I have a few more slides. So the, the one thing that's kind of annoying about BPF Verifier is that your program can be safe and also at the same time fail to pass the Verifier. And this, is, this, this could happen, especially if the compiler tried to use some more advanced logic, like I think register splitting and 
it will end up being some like the 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 code is safe, but the verifier is not smart enough to determine that it's safe, so it will reject it, and it's kind of like an endless battle between the compiler and the verifier. Like when the compiler gets smarter, the verifier has to also try to get smarter, or if if we cannot work around that, we also we then have to try maybe add some option or pragma into our BPF program. And that could get kind of annoying. So usually the newer kernel gets better, of course, at, at verifying code. But for the older kernel, um, sometimes you have to stick to older version of Clang LLVM to get the code working. Or, or you could just write BPF instruction coded by hand, which which could be a thing. And it's actually a lot easier to write than, than say, x86 or ARM instructions. And, and yeah, so in theory, uh, all the program that BPF Verifier allows that passive verification should be safe. But in practice, uh, of course, as you can Im imagine, there's bugs. So bugs with BPF verifier ends up being security issue and usually gets assigned with CVE. And one of the one of the CVE that I have fixed recently is actually around TNUM. So so TNUM, as I mentioned, TNUM has some problem on its own. Basically, it cannot represent a very tight bound. And one of the bugs that happened is that the BPF verifier tried to do a bound check using TNUM. And I think it's it's a doing it's something like the verifier is hoping that it can bound check the return value between one and two. But the return value ended up being three and it still passed the verifier. So yeah, so so things get kind of tricky around value tracking. And that's, I think that's pretty much all I have to say. All right. You ever wanted to go through 200 slides in 35 minutes? This is how you do it. <laughs> yeah, and, and Daniel also mentioned that Alex Seed gave a talk on BPF. So it's, uh, I also recommend it. It's quite interesting. And one of the solutions that uh, Alexi proposed is that people often complain how Fairfire rejects their safe code. And one thing that, that Alexi proposed is to have some sort of annotation, kind of like an assert within your BPF program. So with the assert, you can tell the BPF Fairfire to assume following condition is true. So the BPF verifier knows your program is safe. And if that condition is not met, supposedly the stack gets unwind and such. So that's that's also a possible great feature to see. <laughs>